Hello, community, and welcome to Real Conversations with Dr. Anita. I am your host, Dr. Anita Polite Wilson. We are wrapping up the month of December and 2020 with a rear view look in the mirror at 2020 as we leave it behind and it gets smaller and smaller. And as we look forward to going into 2021, I am so excited to have my very special guest with us today, Ms. Nicole Hadley. She is a marriage and family therapist. And uh, I'm excited to talk with Nicole. She's going to be um, talking with me about general things that folks faced in 2020. Um, specifically, we're going to be talking about how she helped me through 2020. And then we're going to be talking about some tips and techniques to get us started in 2021 on the right foot. Nicole, welcome. And thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you, Anita, for this opportunity and for letting me come and be a part of this a great experience. So I'm so happy to have you. And I'm looking at our backgrounds. I, I feel like we're in a a log cabin somewhere nice and warm and there's a fire crackling and we're just having a conversation, right? I love that. That's, you know, relaxed together, connecting. Yes. Relaxed together, t- connecting. So I had alluded to the things that I experienced in my um, Real Conversations with Dr. Nita podcast. Uh, I'm sorry, my Insanity Check with Dr. Nita podcast. My crew and I, we were talking about what seemed really crazy in 2020 and how we dealt with the crazy in 2020 Mm -hmm. and um, what we're going to do more of, less of, start or stop moving forward into 2021. And I shared just briefly about the things that um, I was faced with in 2020, losing my dad in February, in March, losing $20,000 approximately in business Mm -hmm. because COVID shut down and being a coach and consultant, literally my work is with people Um, talking about the fact that a hip replacement surgery that I didn't even know I needed to have, which was scheduled for March, got pushed off until May. And even in May, it got pushed off twice more because of COVID testing. My mother falling and breaking her ankle. And um, the fact that when I found you, I want to say it was in the springtime. Um, You probably know better than I do when we actually started. But what I found so beneficial about talk therapy in particular, and I said this to you on many of our sessions, was just being able to take what was in here and setting it before us so that you could help me process it so that the negative stuff lost its power and eventually went away. Tell me, the in layman's terms, the science behind talk therapy and why it was so beneficial. And before I let you answer that question, it was in talk therapy that you helped me realize that a lot of what I had been dealing with prior to my dad passing and why I didn't have such an emotional response that I had expected. And I almost felt like, geez, did I really love daddy that much was because you said I had processed a lot of anticipatory grief so that by the time he passed, I was able to let him go. Well, and I just want to, as you reflected back on everything that happened in that last year, um, I, hear it and I think, oh my gosh, I was with her along that journey. Mm -hmm. And so what I think is fabulous about talk therapy, it's not about what I or what the therapist is forcing change on. It's giving you that space to say, all of this happened to me. How is it impacting me? But also I think having just a space to share your story Um, is so supportive um, to be able to just talk and not be hopefully judged or be forced to answer specific questions, to just have that space to be, whether it's good, bad, sad, ugly, emotional, cheerful. Mm -hmm. Um, So that is one thing about talk therapy that I have found supportive is just to have space to get it out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did that answer your question? It did answer my question. And as you're talking and you mentioned the fact that you were along with me on the journey, it was more like mm-hmm. we were kind of the visual that comes to mind right now is we were hiking together through mm-hmm. some stuff. Right. And you were never in front of me. you were never behind me. You were alongside me on my journey. And what I originally was hoping for, to be honest with you, and we had this conversation in our first session, I was hoping for a woman of color because I felt a woman of color could better 
relate to me and identify to the things that I was going with. And it actually was shortly after, it was just prior to or shortly after um, George Floyd was killed on television that um, you and I were talking about what I must be feeling as a woman of color, as an African-American woman, as a black woman, as a woman who is visible and visibly shaken in what was going on in society. And what I discovered was for me at that time, what was most important was not necessarily having a woman of color who was a therapist, but having a therapist who could connect to me as a woman of color. How on earth were you able to do that? Um, what, and it's so interesting that we're, we're bringing this up because I felt um, at first fear um, how am I going to support this? How is my perspective going to impact my role as a therapist? But what came most importantly is it's not about my role as a, as a therapist. It was about humans and about I have no idea what it feels like as a person of color. I know how it felt as a white person to see that on, on TV to think, how could this? I have chills thinking about that. So I just wanted to hear your story and how it impacted you so I can learn because I could never understand and experience it, but I can be an ally and just mm -hmm. um, be, just be there. When you mention the word ally, I think of a phrase that, that is used a lot in my work, diversity, inclusion, and belonging. You don't have to be one to stand with. And at that time, you didn't have to be a black to be able to stand with me in my pain, which goes back to what you said about it's about being human and connecting on a human level. So you mentioned fear in and this is the first time that you've mentioned this to me, fear and wondering how am I going to support her? Tell me, what was that like for you? I think it again, as that role as a therapist, it was to remind myself, this isn't about me and my fear. It's about Anita and her fear. What is the fear that she is experiencing right now? Because yes, I can learn and grow from this, but really as hopefully as a good therapist, it's not about my fear and not even about what I experienced, but to connect with what you experience so I can only become a better person and therapist and ally. So I'm curious to know how working with me impacted your, your outlook, your perspective on working with another woman of color, especially during that time of this past mm -hmm. summer that we processed together. <sighs> I thank you for asking that because I will say through the recent years of my training, um, there was a part of me that felt I lost um, a role that I wanted to fulfill working with people of color, whether that's a black woman and um, you know any person of color as a white dominant culture, ethnic woman, um, it can be threatening and it can be um, like you, like you mentioned, just that, that ability to connect with the same culture, because there is a reason why you connect with the, with people of color and a black woman better than a white woman. And, um, but I think what I realized is that a, being a white therapist and working with a person of color is actually a huge benefit for our society because we're actually building safe and trust relationships. And that's how that trust and those that relationship and building, modeling how we can get to know one another and be curious versus being defensive mm -hmm. um, in, in our in our world, in our views. Mm -hmm. um, and I it really gave me a new confidence that although some science might say it's healthier for a person of color to work with a person of color we know that there's not as many options in the professional world to connect with a person of color in, mm -hmm. multi, uh, in all ethnicities besides the white, normally male dominant field of um, psychology. 
And mm -hmm. it just made, it, it gave me a new inspiration to say that, yes, it might be better, but there's also huge opportunities. And to work with a person of color can only build opportunities and actually create a safe and model what, um, you know, diverse relationships can actually look like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that, especially in the work that I do, again, working with companies um, to establish diversity, inclusion, and belonging in their organizations. I think that what you just said is critical. And that's something that when I'm working with the leaders first, before we even begin to cascade, you know, these messages throughout the company is what does your own personal circle look like? Because how can you possibly effectively, number one, relate to the employees that happen to be of color? And number two, how can you explain to your downline, to your directors and your managers and your supervisors and your team leaders, what that means to interact differently with employees of color? If you have none of those relationships in your personal circle, how can you possibly be effective trying to bring this message to the organization and it's not even shown up in your own life? Mm -hmm. So as a, um, as a professional who happens to be in the realm of therapy, Tell me, you know, how all that comes together. Well, and I think it also comes back, it kind of highlights the, the value of talk therapy mm -hmm. is as leaders and as leaders and humans, as humans, we need to be present and we need to become curious um, about other stories versus trying to defend our thoughts and our stories all the time. Mm -hmm because I think that's where the disconnect comes from is we're so ready to prove our point that we don't listen. Mm -hmm. And if we just asked questions and became curious yes. and it would allow all of us to become more comfortable with just being curious mm -hmm. versus needing to be defensive to our feelings and our thoughts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they're all bad. Mm -hmm. We all yeah. have our experience and our perspective, but to become yeah. curious versus, um, you know, needing that right. Um, there was a beautiful quote I wrote about indige indigenous people saying it's not a right, it's an obligation. And that Western society brought this sense that it's my right to do this. Mm -hmm. But I think if we start looking at it's our obligation to become curious, it's our obligation mm -hmm. to connect, it's our obligation to share our story Mm -hmm. um, is, is really powerful. A couple of the concepts that I explore with leaders is the difference between um, intellectual arrogance mm. and cultural curiosity. Mm. Well, what and I remember us kind of talking about how intellectual humility mm -hmm. to accept that we don't know everything yeah. is, is a hard pill to swallow. Mm -hmm. But that's that sense of curiosity, right? Instead of mm -hmm. looking at it as I, oh, I don't know this. I'm not. I'm. Um, it's a. It's a bad quality, or I'm lacking in this quality. Turning it into this, wow, it's an opportunity to learn, to become mm -hmm. curious, to almost maintain that childhood sense of curiosity, mm -hmm. and um, that wanting and desire to just want to play and get to know each other. So when we're thinking about uh, people, people of color, not just black women, but people mm -hmm. of color in general, when they decide to seek some professional help, whether it be talk therapy or really deep involved counseling, mm -hmm. what are some things that they need to look for to make sure that they can be comfortable with the fates that's presented to help them? Mm. Um, I think the most important thing is to feel that comfortable trust um, mm -hmm. and that really you should be able to maintain your cultural values and your thoughts and your worldviews with any therapist. Mm -hmm. That it's not about um, what the therapist has planned, but what is it that you want? That um, really that supporting that self-efficacy self is important. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, and I think it's going to be different for every person. 
because depending on their own cultural norms and their own values, um, but to also understand that it does take time to build trust, to not mesh into it. Um, and that it's normal to feel uncomfortable. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a new process, especially for some cultures who, um, the, you know, the stigma with mental health is so big in the world, no matter, you know, no matter the culture or ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there are specific different cultures that really have a hard time um, looking at it as a, a normal um, health need. So I think um, just understanding or hopefully knowing that it's not about changing your values and your, your core thoughts, but to really kind of bring in your unique views and your ideas because you're worthy of who you are and who you want to be, mm -hmm. no matter who's telling you what. Mm -hmm. I think that's a huge, huge point to make in the fact that different cultures value um, mental health and wellness mm -hmm. and the means of getting to a mentally healthy and well state differently. And some cultures do still have a stigma around that. And uh, while not every culture values that in the same way, I want to segue into something that everyone can relate to, especially in 2020, and that's a sense of grief in one form or another. Either it's the grief of the loss of a loved one due to COVID. It's the grief associated with perhaps the loss of a job, perhaps the loss of what normal is. Mm -hmm. um, that we can define grief in any uh myriad of, of forms and I think almost everyone on the planet can can relate to grief and loss this year in some way or another. So I'd like to focus on that for a little bit and um, from two different perspectives. The, the first perspective being very personal. I had mentioned at the beginning of our conversation that what you really helped me to understand was when my father passed, why I felt like I wasn't grieving enough, why I felt like I wasn't crying enough, well, I, why I felt like I wasn't emotional enough, why I felt like I wasn't depressed enough. And you helped me to understand that that was because I had already processed through anticipatory grief. Can you give us a little bit more about that? Because when you told me that, I felt, oh, okay, I am normal. I just did all the grieving before the actual event. And so I'm able to pick up the pieces a little bit sooner than someone who might do their grieving after the actual event. So tell mm -hmm. us a little bit more about that. Well, and I think grief is interesting because there is no right, wrong, or linear way to do it. I, I, I want to interrupt you right there because for the longest, again, I thought there was something wrong with me. I thought maybe I didn't love daddy as much as I should have mm -hmm. because you helped me discover that my grieving came beforehand. And I'm curious, I'm going back to you, I'm curious as to what kind of, what part of our conversation helped you kind of see that that anticipatory, that building up or what you see as that anticipatory grief? What did that anticipatory grief look like for you? Honestly, the fact that I had no clue that anticipatory grief was a thing really made me feel like, okay, I, I'm normal. It's not that, you know, now that we've had the service, I haven't fallen apart. I was like falling apart in stages before the service. Mm -hmm. I remember um, when we were in the hospital for the last time with daddy, before they sent him home, the doctor was talking to me and my mother and he turned to my mom and said, how's his quality of life? And she said, fine. And the doctor turned to me And asked me, how's this quality of life? And I looked at the doctor. I couldn't look at my mom. I looked at the doctor. I said, it's not good because every time I call, he's taking a nap. And the doctor said, that's a very important sign. So they sent us home with daddy. And the doctor said we might have six weeks. I don't even think we had a full week. And before we went home, as the doctor was leaving, I turned to my mother 
And I said, Mommy, I'm sorry. I hope you don't think I betrayed you, but I had to tell the doctor the truth. Daddy's quality of life is not good right now. And she looked at me, she said, I know, baby, you didn't betray me. I just didn't want to face it, but I know you're right. So because I was willing to be honest with myself about the decline in daddy's health for several weeks before we had that conversation in the hospital, I now recognize that that was anticipatory grief. And again, just awareness of that phrase helped me more after the fact because after the service, I was pull it, I was able to pull it together a little bit sooner than everybody else in the family because I had been grieving ahead of time. And I think what you also brought into this great conversation, an important conversation is we all have different roles mm -hmm. in our family and with that relationship of whatever we're grieving. And that is also gonna impact our ability to anticipate you know, whether it's anticipatory grief or needing to grief, the type of grief it is, um, traumatic death or that that um, uh, unknown loss of a job that you weren't expecting. Mm -hmm. um, so that also impacts that process. And um, kind of with this discussion of grief at this time is a huge, I think, new passion project for me as I move forward in my career is really looking at how the limited ability to grieve together as a family mm -hmm. for individuals who had to die alone or mm -hmm. had to go through grief of, through the loss of a job without that social support yes. is going to have long-term impacts, bringing yes. in cultures, right? Yes. If some, if a culture has um, specific um, rituals after someone dies, not being able to do those activities and honor them can mm -hmm. have long-term emotional impacts on a grieving process mm -hmm. and almost sometimes maybe interrupt the grieving process, creating complications. And, you know, so I just want to thank you for bringing this to the new forefront of mental health, um, because I think with everything that's happened in 2020, right? In that rear view mirror, we still have to, we're looking forward, but some of those reflections are gonna come into our forefront mm -hmm. and we have to face them head on and understand all of the emotional trauma. It's not mm -hmm. just grief, it's trauma mm -hmm. that we've gone through for the almost over a year. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the, the fact that as individuals, we don't have to go through this alone. Yeah. And um, hopefully we can find the support to get there. I'm glad that you brought in the word trauma because I think in addition to the psychological safety uh, factors that people are dealing with, uh, some a loss of security, some a loss of autonomy, some a loss of trust, some a loss of esteem, especially if they've lost their jobs and can no longer sit, you know, be the breadwinner and provider for their family. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about how can we take the lessons of 2020, many of which were painful in different areas of our lives, mm -hmm. to different degrees of our lives, in different stages of our lives. Mm -hmm. How can we take the valuable lessons learned from 2020 and move forward in 2021? What are some strategies that we can implement? Even if it's just one thing that we're consistent with, what can you give me and our listeners to hold on and walk into 2021 with knowing that we're going to make it? If I could give one thing, the most important thing that I have found supportive is you have to find the gifts every day. What is the gift I got from this experience? What is that gratitude? So almost starting every day with a sense of gratitude and ending every day with a sense of gratitude. And when I say the gift, it's really finding the gift out of the negative. Mm -hmm. um, and some days it's easier to do that than others. Yeah. Um, but I will say the gift that I found of needing to be locked down is it probably supported my own sanity, trying to do work full time, working all over Orange County, trying to see clients and to be able to 
get the experience of connecting with someone. Telehealth was mm -hmm. huge. And you were one of my first clients that I had to build a relationship on a screen. And can I tell you, you did an amazing job because when our sessions ended, I felt like I just lost a friend because we talked, I want to say 12 weeks, twice a week. I started my week with you on Monday and I, I ended my week with you on Thursdays. And when those 12 weeks ended, it was a real transition. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm happy to say that I went through it well. And I'm happy to say that I'm looking forward to um, doing it again next year, just because I want to make sure, you know, like our tune-ups on our cars, I want to mm -hmm. make sure that I stay tuned up. Yeah. And for me, talk therapy was the level of therapy that I needed to keep myself from going uh, crazy or from staying under the sheets more often than I did. And so to your point, finding gratitude every day, I think that's, that is absolutely what we need to do. Some days, to your point, it's going to be harder than others. For me, that leads me to resiliency and having to redefine what resiliency means for me now in this stage of life versus what it meant for me in my 20s and 30s. In my 20s and 30s, resiliency was go, go, go and never take no for an answer. And now at this stage in my life, resiliency means recognizing that every day being resilient is going to be different. Mm -hmm. Some days for me, being resilient is going to be just getting out of the bed. And you saw mm -hmm. those days. You saw those days where it was all I could do to log on and just sit there for a few minutes before I could find the words. Mm -hmm. Some days resiliency means, you know, running like I used to nonstop meeting, 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 activity, activity, activity for 12 hours. Some days that's what my resiliency looks like. Some days my resiliency looks like, OK, my planner is full. It's noon. I'm tired. I'm watching movies for the rest of the day. And so we need to, I think, walk into 2021. To your point, finding gratitude in every day, even if that gratitude means, OK, for today, I recognize that resiliency means this and not beating myself up for it. Almost self-compassion, a new sense yes. of self-compassion. Yes. Right. And I think mm -hmm. sometimes another point to that is moving forward that resiliency is built by us using self-compassion so we allow ourselves to step out of our comfort zones because that resiliency is built by us being like oh i can step out and yeah. i can either fail and still move on or be really successful and know and build on that but once you step out of that comfort zone i had a friend just yesterday she said I stepped out of my comfort zone. I said, well, tell me about that. And she said, I put up Christmas lights and just putting up Christmas lights. But she was aware that that was out of her comfort zone. And yeah. I said, how was that for you? And she said, it was fabulous. It was easy. Yeah. So being aware that it's hard for us to step over that line. But mm -hmm. once we do, it's really not as hard as we think it's going to be, or we, I doubt, we doubt ourselves, right? We almost doubt ourselves. So moving forward, get rid of that doubt, bring in that self-compassion and be grad, find that gratitude. I love what you just said. Remove the doubt, bring in the self-compassion and find the gratitude. Mm -hmm. I usually say it in terms of extending grace to yourself and others, mm -hmm. but um, that is so powerful. And I think I might put up some Christmas decorations. Again, this is our first season without daddy and I just, you know, didn't feel that we're taking mom mm -hmm. away um, to um, uh, Airbnb just to get her in a different environment, but someplace that's safe. Me, my husband, my brother and my mom. And, you know, my brother asked me, so are you going to decorate? I'm like, for what? Nobody's coming over. He said, no, you need to decorate. You need to do it for you. So I think based on your story, I'm going to pull out at least one Christmas tree. I like to decorate with very decorative, festive Christmas trees. So I think I might pull out one. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, in our last couple of, of minutes, Nicole, I just want to thank you so much for being willing to come on the air and make me a little bit more comfortable and a little less afraid of sharing from my own personal experience, something that I hope at least mm -hmm. one of our listeners can benefit from. Um, one thing that I want to ask you before we go to close up the session, when you celebrate anything, What's your favorite way to celebrate? Because on my last show, I encourage my listeners, celebrate more, celebrate even those small things. And it doesn't have to be, you know, spending exorbitant amounts of money. But 
how do you like to celebrate? I like to celebrate dancing, whether okay. it's I, with a great one of my favorite songs and just dance. Dancing around is and is just something that brings me joy and is celebrating my life and celebrating just everything I have. So dancing just to my favorite songs is one of my favorite ways to celebrate. And I can totally see that. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole Hadley, marriage and family therapist. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for helping me close out my last podcast of the year. Um, I like to end uh, each month with a real conversation with someone that I consider to be a subject matter expert. And typically when we have these, you know, end of the year reviews and it's usually bloopers and funny things and, you know, oh my goodness, I can't believe that happened. But this month I really wanted to be real about, you know, the craziness of this year. But I also wanted to leave people with, okay, so this is the reality, but here are some tools that you can take with you into 2021 and to realize that in the grand scheme of things, in the long view, we're still here. We made it. So whatever doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Those of us that are still here, um, 2020, it may not have been what we would have hoped, but the fact that we're still here, it was that bad, right? Absolutely. Those gifts. And Those I, gifts. I heard like the many gifts that you found. So Anita, thank you for this opportunity and for letting me end the year with you in this in this format. Um, I really enjoyed it. I couldn't have thought of anyone better to help me end the year and kick it off well with, with my listeners. And to all of you who have joined me, these past several months and these past several podcasts, this is my gift from my heart. I don't know how many more of these podcasts I will do. Um, I don't know what form or shape that they will take in 2021, but I want to thank you for joining me in this part of my journey. I hope that you have been blessed by what I've shared just as much as I've been blessed by the people who I've asked to come alongside me, like Nicole, like my insanity crew check, um, and all of the other guests that I've had on Real Conversations. I had no idea, because I know some people do podcasts as a vanity project, but that's not it for me, and I hope you can sense that. But um, I just wanna thank everyone who's been watching. Steph Nagami, you know what? That one text that you sent me, Steph, was such a shot in the arm, and it was during that time when I was actually wondering, do I wanna continue with this? And so now that I've ended the year, I'm really gonna ponder what 2021 will bring in terms of podcasts. But to all my, my listeners, my viewers, thank you for coming along this journey with me so far. Um, pray with me, um, continue to encourage me, continue to send me some love. I am trying to figure out uh, my social media diet, so to speak, because it's not necessarily my thing. But um, if I have something to give to the world, I want to, to do that. So um, subscribe to uh, the podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel, Anita, uh, Dr. Anita PhD, and send me an email. I want to know, is this working for you? And you can reach me at Anita at DrAnita.com. You have to spell it out, Anita at D-O-C-T-O-R-A-N-I-T-A.com. To all of you, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy Holidays, and let's go into 2021 with intention. As always, stay blessed and keep it real.